and welcome to Crash Course Cryptozoology. Within the last two months, very thought-provoking pieces of evidence have been brought forward regarding the legendary Loch Ness monsters. Specifically, not one, not two, but three different sonar hits have come out of the loch, showing purportedly unknown and large animals moving across the loch's bottom. To an untrained eye, these images immediately raise a plethora of questions. Are these objects actually large? Are they actually animate? Are we seeing debris? Are we seeing objects that are actually schools of fish and therefore highly explainable? Or, really, is this something that is new to our eyes regarding Loch Ness? And if it is, how would we know that? Before these images can be analyzed in a way that will attempt to answer most of those questions, one must understand exactly what sonar is. After all, sonar is itself a very fascinating subject, and like any other scientific device, it must be understood for its results to be understood. Without further ado, I'll now present some crucial information on sonar technology and follow it up with analyzing the new Loch Ness sonar hits, their history, and their content, using that now in more informed angle. At its core, sonar is a concept that states that sound can be used to visualize the environment. The first use of very primitive sonar was recorded by none other than Leonardo da Vinci in 1490. While da Vinci himself was not the one carrying out this practice, it is known that he recorded that one could, and that some did, use tubes inserted into the water with their ears put up to them to detect the sounds of seafaring vessels coming close to the shoreline. Similar devices, like underwater bells, were also used early on to send out audio signals to lighthouses that ships were approaching. However, sonar as we know it really upped its scientific game during World War I. This was, of course, when it became highly necessary to start using audio visualization within the ocean, considering the amount of submarines being used in that particular war. This more precise form of sonar was a machine that would send out an audio blip, if you will. This blip, the sound it produced, was something that people operating and looking at the sonar knew traveled at a certain speed, no matter what happened. The machine would also listen for the same signal's echo, as it would hit objects in the ocean. What this allowed for sonar to do was not only show return echoes visually in terms of where it was echoing off of and therefore where objects were in the ocean, but knowing the rate at which this sound traveled also allowed observers to understand exactly how far away from their machine the object creating the echo was. As time went on, sonar became more precise in the sense that the way it was able to visualize the objects became much more comprehensive. Contemporary sonar allows us to even detect the rough shape of objects, depending on what level of sonar we're using, and even whether or not an object is moving or is still. The way that an object can be seen to be moving or still lies within the shape of the sound being produced by sonar. When we imagine sonar, commonly we imagine something that kind of radiates outward, or even sometimes we imagine a sort of straight beam of sound. However, neither of these is exactly true. The shape of the sound, so to speak, that sonar produces is actually something like a cone. Because of this cone shape, when an object is detected that is moving through the cone, it itself is sort of visually distorted, if you will, into the same rough shape as a cone, often appearing, at the very least, as a somewhat crescent shape. Objects that are not attached to the seafloor or other objects that are crescent are more often than not moving objects, while objects that have more precise shapes are often still. Of course, this depends also on the quality of the sonar being used. Most sonar will show you this crescent-shaped object when something is moving. However, higher-end sonar can still show you exact shapes while still demonstrating that the object is moving. 
whether or not an object that's moving is actually an object or a collection of objects can also be seen in the color being produced on the sonar's graph, often being represented with something very vibrant and solid as opposed to a sort of duller color produced by not one big solid object echoing sound, but rather many tiny objects. Sonar, of course, is often used in many different practices, mostly fishing and marine research. Of course, the kind of marine research that sonar was used in this particular example is a rather unusual but intriguing one. The first example we got of this rather intriguing new database came out on September 31st, 2020, having been caught by boat tour director Ron McKenzie. Caught at a depth of roughly 190 meters down, the sonar contact shows a bright, lump-like object drifting or swimming above the bottom of the lock, producing a somewhat crescent shape. Near the end of October, Ron McKenzie's company caught another very similar sonar contact at about 185 meters down, which produced a similar shape and a similar distance from the bottom of the lock, albeit in a different area. Mr. McKenzie, however, is not the only boater to come out with strange sonar readings from Loch Ness recently. After Ron McKenzie produced his findings, Rod Mitchie, another boat skipper, produced his own that he claims he caught back in June of 2015, a reading he was nervous to come out about until his colleague Ron McKenzie came out with his. Caught at a depth of about 750 feet down, the contact is very similar to Ron McKenzie's, using a slightly lower quality sonar machine and demonstrating that potentially it was something touching the bottom of the lock. However, again, the quality brings that into question, as of course, being pixelated, it's tough to know whether or not this is actually connected to the bottom, or is in fact only slightly above the bottom, like in the McKenzie readings. Looking at the three of these readings, it is instantly noticeable that these do appear to be moving objects of some sort. Particularly in the McKenzie readings, we see the classic crescent shape to the objects which indicates that they are, in fact, moving through the cone of sound being produced by McKenzie's sonar. All three of the objects in this data set also display a rather bold coloration, suggesting that they are, in fact, one object and not a collection of objects. Both of these suggestions were later confirmed by McKenzie's sonar's company, Ray Marine, who offered to examine the photographs and deducted that they were, in fact, solid objects moving animately through the sound. Not only was it determined by the company that these were probably moving objects, but their size could also be estimated. Using the measurement of depth scale at the right of McKenzie's sonar screen, it can be inferred that the objects that McKenzie captured are between 10 and 12 meters in length, which would translate into roughly between 30 and 40 feet. Using the same kind of inference can be suggested that the Mitchie subject is roughly 25 feet in length. Although, again, pixelation of this lower quality sonar may be affecting that estimate. So, what is it that we're looking at here? Unfortunately, the sonar can't tell us that. There are certainly people who are opinionated on the subject. Mitchie and Mackenzie both uphold the idea that this is, in fact, some kind of large, as of yet uncatalogued animal, whether it be a large eel or otherwise, that lives inside Loch Ness, or at least frequently visits Loch Ness. The consistency of the readings certainly might be said to uphold that same idea, although obviously readings can be misinterpreted. Perhaps these are all large, stray pieces of debris that happen to be caught up in similar currents that produced similar images. Whatever they are, they are certainly significant to the case for the Loch Ness Monsters, in the sense that they at least demonstrate that large, seemingly animate objects can be observed in the depths of Loch Ness. Of course, the debate as to whether those are actually Loch Ness Monsters, or as to whether they are more known phenomena that can be used to explain sightings of Loch Ness Monsters, is the matter of debate. I hope this video has produced a better understanding of sonar so that when contacts like this come up, 
one can have a better understanding of what exactly is being looked at. A lot of headlines don't exactly give people the same sort of look into the subject that something like a video or a more lengthy article might give. I would love to know what all of you think of these sonar hits in the comments. Obviously, they're quite interesting as, as bits of media and, of course, as bits of potential evidence. That being said, until next time.